Support provided by Walters Papillon Thomas Cullens, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years. I'm happy now to uh, introduce our moderator today, who is another towering figure in Louisiana's history of public service and national public service, Senator Mary Landrieu. Well, good morning, everyone, and what a wonderful turnout this morning to honor really an extraordinary woman, Governor Kathleen Babineau Blanco. Woman extraordinaire, political leader, civic leader, community leader, mother, grandmother, and I think great grand? Not yet, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to keep up with this growing family of the Babineau Blancos, and it's one of the largest, so it's hard to keep up with, but soon to be great grandmother. And I'm so honored to be asked to uh, moderate this extraordinary panel of individuals that have followed Governor's career, have been part of the helping of developing and making and building that career, uh, to give even a broader perspective, Dean, than you so eloquently uh, just shared with us. So it's really wonderful to be here. We have about an hour and 45 minutes to be together, and I think you're going to find it quite exciting. We're going to have a short presentation by each of our panelists who have been asked to sort of focus on a particular area of the governor's legacy, something that she and her family and all of us are proud of, and our state will literally benefit for generations to come. And uh, so it's going to be an exciting morning, and I'm already noticing that we either wore our Babineau Blanco blue or we wore our Cajun, you know, crazy Cajun red. So, so we're, we're ready to go. Um, and let me briefly introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, as I said, we would do it, um, I'm going to do the introductions all together, and then as I, they're being, they're introduced, they'll start their presentations, either seated or standing. And we're also going to have questions and comments, you know, as appropriate from the audience. And Governor, you can always speak, no matter when, you know, whatever. Yeah, you can interrupt, you can, you can't filibuster, but other than that, <laughs> it, it will be uh, welcomed. Let me begin with uh, Kim Hunter-Reed, uh, who is uh, Dr. Reed, who is now serving as our Commissioner of Higher Education. Um, secondly, we will hear from Dr. Deanne uh, Kalick. She's a professor of sociology, head of the department here. She holds her doctorate from Louisiana State University. Sean Wilson, uh, Secretary Sean Wilson, Dr. Wilson, Secretary Wilson serves as chief of staff. Uh, for D he served as chief of staff for DOTD for 10 years. Now he's a secretary himself. Fourth, we have Dr. Christy Malloy, Ph.D. and Professor of Political Science at UL, right here at UL. And then finally, we have um, Dr. David Kay, um, who is uh, the Department of Criminal Justice at UL. He holds advanced degree in pharmacy and pharmaceutical scientist. And sixth, Terry Porsche Ricks, um, two decades of legal and financial human services policy management experience. She's currently the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Children and Family Services. So we have a wonderful panel this morning chosen by the um, university here. So Kim, why don't we start um, with you, Dr. Reed, and they can stay seated or stand whatever they're comfortable, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's Wonderful to be here, Governor. It's so wonderful to see you. Um, I had the honor, of course, of working for Governor Blanco on so many issues, so I am excited to talk about her legacy of education and how we move that legacy forward. When I think about the intersection of her work and education in Louisiana, in America, I think about the term against all odds. I remember when uh, we were working on inauguration and excited about seeing Louisiana's first female governor take that helm. Uh, there was an article that said previously that the lieutenant governor's seat was a poor launching pad to be governor, and it could not be done. 
And so many times she's had this conversation about it cannot be done, and yet she's shrugged and said it will be done, and she moved it forward. And so I think this intersection, whether it's education or election, against all odds, is at the center of what I want to talk about. When the governor spoke and began her work, she said education is poverty's mortal enemy. And as I think about my work today and the legacy of where we are, that truly is still the case. We have in America, in Louisiana, as you know, so many equity gaps that have to be addressed. And so when I think about the fact that talent has no zip code but opportunity does in America and Louisiana, what do we do to ensure that a student's race, their family background, and their geography does not determine their likelihood of success? She spoke to that, and we will continue that legacy of the work. Certainly, as I think about her educational legacy, I think about um, her commitment to continuing what works, because she would say to that to us, let's accelerate what works, and let's um, double down on what else needs to be done. So when she saw the pre-K uh, LA4 working, she continued to move that forward and expanded that. Uh, when she saw that we needed to have the teaching profession elevated as a former teacher, she moved that forward and ensured that teachers were paid at the SRB average for a long, before uh, something that hadn't been done in a long time. Higher education had not been funded at the SRB average in 30 years. She did that. And when Hurricane Katrina and Rita came, and the hurricane that was FEMA, she said that we will use this moment in time to rebuild stronger. And so over 100 schools in New Orleans were taken over failing schools. And when we watched the news together with her after the hurricanes, and we saw children from Louisiana going to school for the first day, she said to me, those parents will come back better and those children will come back better because they will know what to ask for. They will have seen quality education somewhere else and they will not stop until they get quality education for their children. And so the recovery school district in New Orleans was part of her legacy as well. Juvenile justice reform, which I'm sure you will talk about, was something that I had a chance to work directly with her on. And then a state like Louisiana that has as much poverty as we have did not have a need-based aid program for our, high, for our higher education students. And so she created in her watch uh, the Louisiana Go Grant program, Louisiana's need-based aid program. Uh, you will see that in the South, there's been a history of merit-based aid for places that have the greatest poverty. Uh, it's been a political issue, and certainly there's a lot of support for TOPS. But it should not be an either or, it should be a both and. And so she recognized that and made sure that we had need-based aid for Louisiana students. So we build on that legacy of a governor who was an educator too, and a mom and a grandmom, and understood the foundation of education as poverty's mortal enemy. And so where do we go now? We obviously have to continue to advance good work when it comes to erasing equity gaps. The gaps still exist, and in some places they are larger. And we have to make sure that we're thinking deeply about this exercise of educating our students. So for me, as the new commissioner of higher ed, I know that I have to do more than say to students, college is great and you should join us. This is a human capital exercise for people in poverty. We have to think about what are the barriers to entry and to success? What are the social determinants of completion in higher education? And how do we step forward with that? Making sure that more students begin college in high school uh, with dual enrollment and concurrent enrollment, that more students have access to quality teachers, to STEM teachers, that they understand that we believe in their unlimited potential. Each and every day, we have to make sure we're doing that, that we're preparing them well, and we are erasing equity gaps and belief gaps in uh, Louisiana in our schools. We also have to think about, as we sit in the, the light center, um, we also have to think about what does innovation mean for education, I think, in our state and in our nation. Knowledge transfer, what will it look like as we move forward in an age of automation and artificial intelligence? How do we skill build for people when we are creating uh, leaders uh, and putting graduating students into uh, the workforce where there are jobs that do not exist yet? How do we prepare students for jobs that do not exist? And how do we prepare for individuals to come back when their jobs move forward because of automation or, or move away 
and they have to be reskilled. How do we do that important work? So I think all of those things are very important. The continuum of education, how are we thinking about our smallest child all the way up to th through our lifelong learner? And how do we think about talent and talent development in a broader way in Louisiana, I think is very important. Um, I always say I'm not really commissioner of higher education in Louisiana, I'm chief advocate for talent development in Louisiana. And when we think about talent in our state, we must think about traditional students and returning adults and veterans and opportunity youth and justice involved individuals and foster youth uh, and all, or the full range of individuals who have talent that is yet to be fully formed. And when we think about college in Louisiana, we have to think about technical colleges and community colleges and four-year institutions so that a student's aptitude and interest determine where they're going, knowing that where they start is not where they will finish. But we have to make sure we understand that we cannot say to our students in this day and age that the four-year degree is the only measure of success. We have to make sure that there is honor in all pathways and that these credentials, this skill building, continues to move forward in our state. So I think all of that is important to the work. When I walk in my office at work, and I've been on the job three months, I look at a photo of my grandmother and Governor Blanco, two educators who have shaped my life, uh, who have been passionate about educating students, who have been uh, committed to the work that must be done, who understood that education was the passport to prosperity. And so I'm honored to be here to thank the governor for her legacy of leadership, for not listening to the naysayers and believing against all odds that she could do it. Uh, it's wonderful to see what a girl can do in Louisiana, everything. And so I thank her for this work, and I am committed to continuing to build on that legacy as we focus on erasing equity gaps and increasing talent development in Louisiana. Thank you. As I anticipate the opening of the Kathleen Babineau Blanco Public Policy Center this coming January, I'm hopeful that the center will address the issues I've spent my adult life trying to improve. In my estimation, the Blanco Public Policy Center has an opportunity to make a tremendous impact on a major public health problem plaguing our country and our state. Suicide is the problem, and it's linked to many other social problems, such as poverty, unemployment, mental illness, and addiction. Suicide is a crisis in America. It's the 10th leading cause of death in the US. It's 11th in Louisiana overall, but for uh, age, the age group of 15 to 34 in Louisiana, it's the third leading cause of death. In Evangeline and Avoyles parishes, the rate is more than double the national average. Nationally, suicide is more than double the murder rate. Four times more people die by suicide each year than from HIV. Some populations appear more at risk for suicide. Men complete suicide four times more often than women. People who are white complete suicide disproportionately to other groups. And people in middle age complete most often. Firearms are used in more than half of suicides each year. Veterans and active duty military personnel have a high risk of suicide, making up 16% of all suicides. In the US, more than 40,000 people die by suicide each year, but that is the tip of the iceberg because more than 130,000 people are hospitalized, 405,000 people visiting the emergency room for self-harm each year, 1 million attempting suicide each year, and 9 million seriously considering suicide each year. So to boil that down for you, for every one person that completes suicide, there are more than 229 people who seriously consider it. Based on all of those facts, few could disagree that suicide is a public health epidemic. But discussion of suicide is shrouded in taboos. Stigma surrounds suicide deaths and mental illness. Although not all people who suicide have di a diagnosed mental illness, about half do, and the remaining may not have access to professional help services or are unwilling to seek help because of cultural attitudes and stigma surrounding mental health. One taboo has been about talking due to a misconception that if we talk about suicide or ask about it, then we put the idea into a person's mind. 
but research suggests that's not the case. They are already thinking about it and are usually relieved to be able to talk to someone about it. Another misconception is that suicide is caused by one thing, specifically depression. But most depressed people don't suicide. The CDC estimates that there are between 15 and 16 million episodes of depression each year in the United States. Yet 45,000 people are lost to suicide, so something else is going on. Another misconception is that it can't be prevented, but it can. 20 years ago, suicide was seen as a private matter between parent, patients and their health care providers. Suicide was not discussed as a public health problem. Evidence about effective treatment was sparse. Clinical training in suicide assessment and treatment was rare. Virtually no funding existed for suicide prevention until 1999, when the Surgeon General issued a call to action to prevent suicide. In 2001, the first national strategy for suicide prevention was developed. In 2002, the first Suicide Prevention Resource Center was developed. And in 2005, the first National Suicide Prevention Lifeline or Hotline was opened. Yet, there has been an increase in suicide rates across the nation during those same 20 years. Every state, uh, in a report that was released by the CDC in June of 2018, uh, they showed that in every state except Nevada had an increase of at least 6% in their suicide rate over the last 20 years, with a 30% increase in more than half of states. In Louisiana, that increase was 29%. Studies of New Orleans specifically has shown an increase in rates in the years following Hurricane Katrina. What do we know about the training needed to prevent suicide? We know it works, even in small doses. We also know we need more of it. In Louisiana in 2008, the legislature passed Act 219 that requires educators to have at least two hours of suicide prevention training, which is a start. SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, has produced several toolkits, including a really good best practices suicide prevention toolkit for schools. But few know it's there or how to use it. It's also a cost issue. We need money appropriated to train educators while they miss class in order to receive training. We also know this, there is no mandatory suicide prevention training in graduate school or to have a license as a mental health professional. Research is clear that nine out of 10 licensed counselors would not pass a basic competency exam for suicide training. This is such a big problem. You expect that the people you refer a person who is at risk to, to be ready to help them. We want anyone who receives someone at risk to have the training and that that training be based in sound research that it works. If I asked anything of our future policymakers, it would be to see about the need for training in mental health. You would never go to a cardiologist who didn't know CPR. But this isn't a problem that will be solved by only one group of professionals like school counselors or therapists in the veteran community or even mental health professionals at large. A community approach is what will get us out of this. It's partially educators in schools. It's partially parents. It's us as researchers asking questions. It's legislators supporting increased funding for suicide prevention. It's physicians because a large number of those who die by suicide saw their doctor within 30 days of taking their life. So we need to do more across more professions. Solving this problem is about making this a conversation around the kitchen table in churches on Sunday. It's making sure the media widely publicized so people know the signs and symptoms and the lifeline number or crisis text line number, where even if they aren't the person who is suicidal, but they are helping, they are assisting someone who is, they can get coaching help in the moment. Solving this problem is about changing school climates in the context of bullying. We have a lot of research about what works, but we don't resource it so schools can do it. Solving this problem is about raising consciousness collectively 
and reducing stigma by talking about it, letting people know real hope is out there. Solving this problem is about educating the faith-based community, especially the clergy. It's about changing access to lethal means by locking firearms and medications away. For example, by offering to take their firearm for a while. We don't let friends drive drunk, we take their keys. It's about looking not just within individuals, but at the community and the system that puts people at risk. It's about agencies partnering with one another to develop strategies that work and making sure that everyone who comes into behavioral health care is assessed and given an individualized path of care, not just involuntary hospitalization in a one-size-fits-all model. So, you know, everything that Deanne said just now makes what we do in infrastructure seem small. <laughs> Um, in, in all seriousness. So um, at the very beginning, uh, let me just say how honored I am to be here and to participate on this panel because uh, what Dean Kellerman said and Senator Landrieu said about Governor Blanco's leadership, uh, what rings true for me is that maternal love effect that she provided for lots of folks, not just her family, but others, because for me, we were extensions of that family. And my time working uh, under her leadership and the example she provided brought that to me and allows me to do that for staff and for folks I work with. And so I'm very honored to be here for that. Um, I will tell you the legacy um, of Governor Blanco's leadership, not necessarily just with uh, her term as governor, but to Public Service Commission, all of those things for me, it comes back to the framework, to the infrastructure, to what we do and how we provide for folks. How do we keep people safe? And so in an environment where we talk about uh, addressing poverty and economic opportunity and community development uh, to attract people, to have a quality of life, it starts in many respects with infrastructure. Just the history of this state began with a river. Uh, the Mississippi River, and it fed the rest of the United States of America. Um, and so infrastructure is pretty critical, and it's something we tend to take for granted. And when I think about the leadership of Governor Blanco, I think about things like safety of folks on the roads, because it was during her tenure that we began installing cable barriers and infrastructure. And those are those sidewalks down the end middle of the interstate that people call them, and those three little wires that you see, they save lives. They've been hit over a thousand times in one year. And every time you hit it, cars don't go through it. Trucks, 18 wheelers, and school buses don't go through it. And when you have a cross median collision, you have a death. So those are lives that were saved, and we're well on our way to over 300 miles. And it started under Governor Blanco. When I think about uh, infrastructure and a model of the timed program that did not uh, sustain itself very well, it got its leap forward under Governor Blanco where she made the decision to proceed with uh, investing in widening the Mississippi River Bridge in New Orleans called Huey P. Long and building the Florida Avenue Bridge. And it was under her leadership that we broke ground, if you remember Governor Myra Murtis on I-49 to connect South Louisiana to the rest of the world in terms of the interstate. And on October 17th, we're going to finish that stretch uh, 30 plus miles of interstate and it's going to be the most beautiful interchange that you've ever seen. Um, sounds funny to say interchange is beautiful, <laughs> but it really will be because it represented a process that the community participated in. It represented a process that they said the artist represented what Shreveport is and we've now made that a part of that infrastructure permanently. And that's the type of leadership that we provided. So where do we go from here in terms of what we do? Well, there are a couple of things I think that from an infrastructure perspective, um, you have to think about disaster. When you look at what's happening in South Carolina and North Carolina, um, so much of what we did here in Katrina, we're still being recognized and leading efforts of resiliency. Uh, I'll be speaking in Colorado talking about how we responded and the things that we did, whether it was contraflow, whether it was how we got reimbursed from FEMA on certain things. Most importantly, we're taking that exercise uh, and that experience known as Katrina to say, how do we improve what we've done? How do we build a bridge bigger, wider, and better? Um, so when the twin spans went under, 
we didn't take the leadership of what the country said, just go back and do exactly what you did. If we knew up front that we're wetter, we're wilder, and we're weirder in terms of our environment, we should be prepared for that. So let's build a bridge higher, let's build the bridge wider to accommodate it. And we were able to do that with the governor's help and leadership in Washington post Katrina. So how we respond in disasters is important to keep people safe and get them out of harm's way. And that's that maternal instinct of safety and protection when you stand in front of those who are vulnerable to protect and keep them safe. So the leadership provided that. The second thing I'll tell you is the development of our communities and our cities all complements the issue of poverty, the issues of education, the issues of health care. If you're someone with some physical disabilities, you need to be able to get on the sidewalk, get into the building, not sit in the rain when you wait on transit or a bus. You need to not trip over routes built into the sidewalk that have overgrown. And so the world we're living in now, I think, is feeding off some of the success in terms of the developmental process. How do we talk to communities? How do we engage with folks to give them what they want with the best practice and expertise of what we as professionals have found? Some of the success, I think, of what the governor provided in terms of connectivity for uh, AI, and from my perspective, it's connected in autonomous vehicles. When you think about the data that this little box produces on a daily basis and how we manage that, it will inform our decision-making process. It will help us be better at what we do to be more sustainable, to be more thoughtful in what that result is. And so I'm, I'm hopeful from an infrastructure perspective that we can have a framework to engage in that with building off of what we've done. And then the last thing I think that uh, stands out for me is sustainable solutions. How do we sustain what we do? In infrastructure, we take for granted that it's always gonna be there. No road is perpetual. I could tell you there are things on the deferred maintenance list for state buildings, for universities, for higher education, uh, for hospitals that were on the list when Governor Blanco was governor to have work done. Infrastructure's the same way. And so when you think about everything you own, buy, sell, or trade, it's interspaced with a road, a rail, a runway, or a river. How do we make sure that we can continue to get the things that we like and we want? So we've got to be sustainable. So this center, in my opinion, offers us a framework to make the types of decisions the way the governor showed us how she made decisions when she was governor. She was nonpartisan. She was thoughtful. But more importantly, she relied on experts, much like Deanne said, well, you're not going to go to a cardiologist that doesn't know anything about CPR. So government is just like that. Government means I need to find out how other places are doing it. We've spent a great deal of time, and Senator Landry is very much aware of what happens in the Netherlands with water. We've got the expertise because we're sitting in that same vulnerable position in the Gulf of Mexico. And so what are the experts telling us? What are the best practices? Let's not assume that we know exactly how to do it all the time. And so from a perspective of helping government, because if nothing else, you will work with governors, and I've had the pleasure of working with uh, two really outstanding ones and another governor. Um, but the idea that every governor, all of the governors you see, work to try and manage a process that legislators, the people who are gonna set the policies, they don't always get it. And so my hope is that this center will help us make better decisions as government with a process that is applicable to all of these issues, if it's criminal justice, if it's higher education, if it's infrastructure, if it's health care. What's the framework that we can make decisions going forward to accommodate these disruptive technologies that we're going to see, these disruptive processes? The idea of 3D printing and all of those things that are going to change how and what we do in very big ways in the very near future, we have to be able to accommodate that from a policy making perspective. And the laboratory of a university, the laboratory of the best and brightest minds, the thinkers, looking at those problems, dissecting them and putting them back together, that is what this policy center can do, regardless of the issue regardless of how we are going to develop as a country. We're always going to have rural, we're always going to have urban, it's all going to be there. Infrastructure is going to connect us, the people are what matters, and I hope and I believe that the Policy Center will provide solutions for that. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and I think the historical record is going to show that Governor Blanco oversaw and managed 
probably the greatest investment of in dollar amount of infrastructure ever in the state's history. And the reason that I think that I can say that is because if you think of the massive infusion of federal money that came shaped by her leadership into the state to build just off the top of my head, $14 billion of levy protection in South Louisiana. You could name three or four other major issues. The $640 million, if I remember my number correctly, of the I-10 bridge that connects St. Tammany to... Oh, it was $790 was it? million. $790, you see? Yeah. I knew the, the, the surface transportation elements under her leadership yeah. was over $8 billion. $8 billion, just surface $8 billion, just surface transportation. Then when you add the levy and flood control protection that was initiated by the governor and the administration, and not just, which is easy to do, and we do this all in our life, it's easy to kind of build the same thing that was there. And it's a tendency to do that, because um, it's easy and you've done it once before, and so the hardest thing is to be creative and building it new and better and stronger. And that was really one of the key leadership legacies that Governor Blanco is going to leave because she insisted just from her own, uh, you know, her own intellect and her own passion and her own knowledge of how societies should grow and develop that we do it better, we build it better, we design it better with more safety and the legacy of um, the Netherlands piece too is something that we had the you know worked on together and and she was phenomenal going finding the best practice in the world bringing it here to Louisiana challenging us to be the best we can be well thank you so much for for having me here and it's a real honor to be able to celebrate the legacy of, of governor Blanco and I talk about policy initiatives for ways that we can continue to improve our state uh, as a political scientist, I'm really interested in issues of civic engagement and how we can get people more involved. And Governor Blanco, just in her legacy as a public servant, has been an inspiration to so many. As the first female governor, uh, it's something to look at uh, for other women to think, I can do that. I could run for office or even have motivation to show up and participate in elections. Uh, Senator Landry has been asking us what our, our first jobs were. As a, uh, a kid growing up in rural Virginia, I grew up on a tobacco farm. So I spent all of my springs and summers and falls you know, out in the field. I was the, and still am, the only person in my family to have gone to college. And having a set of powerful role models around to say that you know, your zip code does not determine your outcome, to say that you, know, you can be an effective participant and a, and a change maker uh, is incredibly important and I appreciate that part of her legacy of, of setting that role model. Uh, so I want to spend a little time today thinking about how we can more effectively get more people involved in, in civic life. And a starting point for thinking about that is voting because for so many people voting is the gateway drug <laughs> into further civic participation in life. Um, Louisiana is unfortunately all too commonly on the wrong end of the list. Whenever we are reported in the national news media for anything, we all sort of hold their breath and think, oh gosh, where are we going to be ranked against all of the other states? And thank goodness for Mississippi and Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, but, but one area where we actually do pretty darn well is voter turnout in presidential elections. In, in 2012, Louisiana was among the top 10 of states in terms of voter turnout. Uh, in 2016, we had 67.8% of our registered voters participate in the election, with on average most other states coming in around 60%. So we, we do a pretty good job of getting our registered voters out for presidential elections. Um, for state and local elections, there's lots of room for improvement. Uh, and to pick on our own parish here in Lafayette, just in our past recent elections on significant and important meaningful policy issues of millage renewals, of, of school bonds and taxes, we have at our height reached 13.8% voter turnout. And on the low end, 2.5%. 
Think of the organizations that you're a part of. Whenever any organization you're, you're with wants to transact business, you have to have a quorum of your members to be able to even hold an effective meeting and make any decisions. And yet, we are routinely making financial decisions, policy decisions for our communities with less than a tenth of registered voters participating to say nothing of the eligible voters who aren't registered and aren't participating. So I want to put forth some avenues for us to think about how we can get more people involved. And in order to increase turnout, we have to begin by getting more people registered. So one option or avenue that we could think about is making it available for um, voters to actually register on the same day that an election is held. Right, you show up at your polling precinct and rather than uh, having to register far in advance, you could do it on that same day. Now here in Louisiana, I want to say we've, we've made some progress. You still have to register 20 days ahead of time, but you can do it from your phone. And public service announcement, you need to do that by October 16th in order to participate in the November 6th election. You can download the GoVote app and you can do it in five minutes, but you still have to do it ahead of time. We now have 15 states in the union that have moved to same day registration. And they have improved on average 7% uh, voter turnout just by making that one simple change. That's a pretty big bang for your buck in terms of policy outcomes. A second possibility that we could consider is moving to automatic voter registration. The way that works is whenever you go and you get any kind of official ID from your state, you're going to go get your new real ID driver's license, you're going to go get um, you know, just an official state ID, you're automatically enrolled to vote. Today, when you go and get those IDs, you're given the option, but it doesn't happen automatically. Oregon has recently adopted this method. And in the 2016 presidential election, they saw the highest increase in voter turnout of any state in the union. And I think far more important, the demographics of the people who voted changed significantly as a result of this measure. The pool of voters in Oregon as a re result of uh, automatic voter registration became more racially diverse and there was a much stronger pool of young voters and low income voters, making the people who registered and showed up look much more like the actual members of their community. But the third avenue that I'd like for us to consider, and that by far can have the biggest impact on changing participation in elections, is by moving the election dates themselves. We can do all that we want in terms of developing voter guides and get out the vote methods. And I do not mean to disparage those because I'm one of the people who does those things. But those pale in comparison to having our local election cycle sync up with the national cycle. For many voters, thinking about voting is a habit. It's like watching the Olympics. It comes around every four years, you tune on your television, you pay attention, you get involved. But most of the rest of the time you're not really thinking about it. Voting works the same way and it's much easier to change the election date than it is to change the habits of voters. In Louisiana, we usually have about four dates every year that are options. Uh, for us to hold elections. These calendars are set by the Secretary of State and they're set years in advance. But local parishes have options on when they actually hold millage elections or elections for local officials. Uh, you could do it in March, you could do it in April, but you could just as easily do it in November. Louisiana has more elections than anybody. Um, and as a result, our voters experience voter fatigue. They just get tired of showing up to the polls. It's also expensive to hold this many elections. Right? You have to pay the polling workers. Not that I want to decrease their pay, but you have to pay them and you also have to pay to transport the voting uh, equipment and maintain it. So actually by syncing up our uh, election calendar with the national calendar, we reduced cost as well as increasing turnout. 
So why do we not do that? Um, one cynical take is that our local parish governments want to hold all of these millage elections on off-cycle dates in the middle of festivals, right, when no one's going to show up because they can be sure to sneak through tax, uh, taxes and get them passed. Well, if that's their strategy, it's a terrible one. Uh, all of the res every single research study that has been done on this issue has shown that low turnout elections are much more likely to have opposition to taxes than support. And the math is simple. The kinds of people who show up for a March election are older, they're much more affluent, and they tend to be white. All demographics associated with anti-tax sensibilities. It's a wonderful pleasure to be here. Uh, and this is such an important time for the state of Louisiana to be in this room uh, to have a university that's connected to such uh, a mission and a legacy as, as Governor Blanco's. Uh, I've, I've seen this operate in different states with different universities, these connections that are so important to creating transformative change for local communities, for the state, uh, that the energy behind this center, I think, will infuse you know, so much more passion into our region that is very hopeful to see and, and start on this path um, now and today and moving forward. Um, I'm a product of Florida. Um, my arch rival, Florida State University, has set up uh, these kinds of networks uh, and relationships with um, agencies throughout the state, and I've seen it work in other settings, and I know it can work here. Uh, when I moved to the state um, in Louisiana in 2010, uh, I noticed that there was a lot of work for a criminologist um, to do. Uh, there was a lot of issues that were facing the state. Um, most notably, our, our incarceration rates were bar none in the world, let alone in the United States. Um, I have a background in substance abuse and addiction, um, which you know, is an advantage for me as a researcher moving here. Uh, but I also had a passion to connect with people build relationships that would start that transformative change. And our moniker here at the University of Louisiana Lafayette is research for a reason. Now, I don't know if that brand has really connected with our researchers, with our academics, uh, nor has it connected with our practitioner partnerships, our agencies across the state. Uh, but again, we're, we're starting on that road now. And I just wanted to um, talk, talk to you about this one little random story uh, that, that comes to mind. When I first moved to Louisiana, young little baby assistant professor, you know, uh, kind of eyes wide open, but really didn't know how things operate, how politics worked, how barriers worked, you know, potentially to, um, you know, these kinds of collaborations. But what I learned quickly was that Louisiana treats people like family. Um, even a, a random Florida boy that moved out um, in his early 30s, Louisiana opened their arms to me and, and treated me like family. Um, so what I wanted to kind of get across is the importance of relationships and just the importance of simple things like making a phone call you know, to people in positions of power, people at agencies, and just have a conversation. You know, get away from the computer, move away from email, just call, leave a message, um, try to make an appointment with some folks to have a conversation. And, and that's really what happened to me that really started me on this path of getting involved with justice reform throughout the state of uh, Louisiana. Um, one day, just randomly, I connected with um, you know, my supervisor at the time, a department head at uh, Loyola University in New Orleans, of you know, just asking, like, who, who can I talk to to you know, get involved, to start a conversation? And, and he put me in touch with um, a sheriff on the North Shore. And the North Shore, uh, you know, so St. Tammany Parish, was the epicenter at the time in 2013 of the incarceration problem of Louisiana, AKA of the, the world. You know, and, and um, plenty of um, newspaper articles, they were you know, splashed in headlines, St. Tammany Parish was of being the number one in Louisiana, which means number one in the world, of incarcerating their adult offenders at a rate that was just blinding. Almost one in a thousand adults, even more than that, 
or behind bars or injustice involved in some way, shape, or form. So, little baby professor dons on uh, his University of Florida polo, you know, goes into the lion's den that was LSU judges, LSU court administrators, LSU. It's like, oh wow, I should have thought differently, but at least we're in the <laughs> SEC. You know, we, we, can, we can enjoy that together. But just had a conversation and creating those relationships of, of just picking up a phone call and talking to people that haven't really dealt with an academic, a scholar in years or knew how to get in touch with somebody that had that that skill set, that, that tool um, that they can use to just get an ear um, for you know, things that were evidence-based, things that were practical, things that we can build together that um, would start chipping away at you know, some of those problems. And, and Dr. Kalik um, notably you know, started all along those lines in terms of evaluating drug courts um, in Louisiana. And our idea is really adapted from that. It's taking those evidence-based programs that we knew worked in the past, and we just put those ideas on steroids together, and we created a program for people that pretty much were one step away from serving a life sentence or doing at least 30 years at Angola. And the innovation was we're going to give some folks in St. Tamina Parish one last chance to operate in a drug court model but the catch was the district attorney wanted some skin in the game. So the skin was to serve two years incarcerated. Um, it was a program that initially started um, on the South Shore in Orleans Parish. Um, but the model that we operated in St. Tammany turned out to be the model of the state. We sent young offenders for the most part. For the most part, they're around age 25 on average. But we even had offenders age 55, just stone cold addicts their whole life didn't really get the help they needed throughout their entire criminal careers. And finally, we infused hope in these offenders. And all of a sudden, you know, we saw that they looked out for one another. Uh, they knew that the court system, the judges who volunteered their time, um, the probation and parole officers who served them, were all aligned with the same hope and the same goal of making sure this individual doesn't return to prison. Um, and in fact, it's the only program that I know of in the United States that uses evidence-based programs for um, offenders that reoffend throughout their life that works over time. That not only past 12 months, you know, do not go back to prison even after that. You know, so we've successfully reduced the recidivism rates of those offenders um, beyond half, which was our goal. And we're trying to replicate these kinds of programs you know, throughout Louisiana. Um, we're trying to expand that to the state. And that's what you know, we're starting here at uh, UL, is partnering with the Department of um, Public Safety and Corrections, you know, bringing that science to our partners and having those stakeholders and meeting with them and understanding their needs, but also meeting with um, our partners where they are, knowing that our resources are limited you know, that we're fatigued after years and years of being 48th, 49th, or 50th, thanks Oklahoma, Mississippi, um, that that family feel of looking out for one another through relationship building, through making sure that we get our partners at the table, but also getting the infusion of the people that we're treating at the table too to understand needs, needs of agencies, needs of the people that are doing the treatment, that are caring for one another. And I want to jump off of what Dr. Kalik was saying, is that, you know, mental illness and mental health is so critical, and we're starting to realize that. Um, but we often overlook the people that are, are working and helping professionals. The people that are in the field, that they're actually not well paid, that are passionate, but are fatigued, that every single day they see failure, and they, they often don't see those successes. And once you align that mission, and you align a university, and you align a brand, that we're doing something for a reason, we're researching for a reason. These aren't just academic questions, and that's a peeve, that's you know, knowledge for knowledge's sake. No, we, we are committing ourselves in partnership with our teams and the people that we treat. 
So this is my first time having to present with glasses, okay? I'm moving, I'm moving along, okay? Um, Governor Blanco, yes, yes. Um, I, so good morning, and I, I have to say, um, I'm just a, such a fan of the governor. I um, have to tell you that um, when the governor was in office, I served as the undersecretary of the Department of Social Services. That was the DCFS's previous name. And my now 13-year-old uh, took her first steps in the budget office on a Saturday <laughs> at DSS. Um, I served under uh, Secretary Ann Silberg Williamson, and um, it was just wonderful uh, to, to work with the governor. And as a foundation to what I want to say about uh, policies with the governor and, and experiences with her and where we are now and where we're going, I just want to give you a snapshot of um, the year of our Lord, 2005, okay? Um, as the undersecretary, I was the chief financial officer responsible for the budget and fiscal, IT, HR, administrative services, and emergency preparedness. At that time, we were a $1.2 billion agency. We employed 5,200 Louisianians to provide child welfare services, economic stability services. We didn't have anybody employed for emergency preparedness. Me. <laughs> we had some people identified, but not employed for that very service. So we were the primary state agency responsible for coordinating sheltering, housing, and human services. So as you can imagine, when we really understood that after all, Katrina really was coming to Louisiana, we got really, really busy helping with the evacuation and sheltering and many, many other things. And then once the storm passed, now we find Louisiana's children, that are, those are in state care. It takes us, that takes on a role while we're still sheltering the tens of thousands of people, while we're then um, also dealing with the 1,400 of our own staff members that were displaced from their offices and while several of our offices are closed. Soon after, we turn our attention to disaster food stamp issuance, then to long-term sheltering, short-term housing, to recovery, long-term recovery. We're still caring for our employees. In response to Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, DSS employees clocked 250,000 hours above their normal work. We still had 1,400 people that were displaced. So now all of those efforts happened with the governor's leadership, federal agencies, local agencies. Someone talked about FEMA, 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 different FEMA every other week, hmm. right? Um, collaborating with nonprofits like never before. So what had to happen immediately after the storms is that our courageous governor had to make some necessary moves to keep us afloat, because of course the federal government haven't yet, hadn't yet given us more money for our recovery. So my recollection shows DSS budget authority by executive order cut soon after that, special session budget cut, expenditures made on behalf of the response and recovery were not budgeted in our office, so cut. We were very concerned. We were very well led. Thank you, Governor. Cushioning and very much complicating the blow of the budget cuts was the federal dollars that then came in because of her audacious fight for the funds to rebuild Louisiana. For DSS, that meant $16.4 million coming in for vocational rehabilitation, $32.4 million extra for TANF, TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needed Families for Emergency Recovery, and the responsibility for us to administer and the opportunity for us to use some of $220.9 million of supplemental social services block grant, SSBG funds. So now, 
We got through this scenario. Nobody got laid off. None of our core services went away, but we had a lot of money to use to tackle some of the things that we needed to tackle. And due to Governor Blanco's leadership, we were well poised to do that because about six weeks before Hurricane Katrina, Governor signed Executive Order KBB 0517. What did that do? Well, it started the Solutions to Poverty Council. And it set up a way for us to uh, look at addressing some of the poverty that we had in the state. If she hadn't done that already, we might not have been so well poised to use the funding that we got. We saw quality child care. We saw early learning increase. We saw the expansion of access to health care for Louisiana's children. We saw the passage of the earned income tax credit and a lot of other great policy. And though we lost some ground after Governor Blanco, due to the current priorities in the current administration, we see new strides. We saw the expansion of the earned income tax credit in the past regular session. We see bipartisan support for other measures. Well, I think uh, we've had a very powerful session this morning, and I want to thank each and every one of the presenters. And it was such a wide variety of, um, of problems that need to be addressed and uh, the search for the, the vehicles to get to the solutions are very critical. So I see an enormous amount of work for this center from the presenters here today knowing that there are many, many more problems out there that are just as critical and have great, great needs. Mary touched on something when she said that, um, that we hear too much about government failure. And when I stop to really listen to the noise around us um, through the, the talk media, we have a lot of people just making empty charges. And there's a crisis as a result of that, a crisis of confidence in government. Nobody believes that their tax dollars are being properly spent because they hear that message every day that government is wasting money. And I would ask you that if you looked at your tax dollar, um, and understood that it was going to be spent to address any one or maybe part of each of these problems, would you consider that a waste? Or would you consider that a good investment? So I think the center has to address that perception problem also. And in Louisiana, we are truly one of the least tax states, but every citizen out there who is not focused and, and just leading a regular life believes that we are overtaxed because that is another message that they're getting from, that, from those talking voices out there. So, you know, I, I um, think that we had a, a classic opportunity to do an analysis of just how much damage cutting taxes to the extreme has done to this state. Costs do not go away, they just get shifted. Higher education deficits um, that were incurred over the, over the years after I left the governor's office were simply shifted to the students. Universities are necessary and needed to survive. And so tuition went up in, uh, dramatically dramatically. When tuition goes up, there are people who are shut out of an opportunity for a higher education. And I began to really watch that and wonder if that was simply not intentional. Support provided by Walters Papillon Thomas Cullins, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years.